welcome to the School of Speech podcast, presented by SpeechTherapyPD.com. School of Speech is designed specifically for the school-based SLP to come together to discuss current topics, tackle difficult situations, and share our insights. Our goal is to bolster confidence, celebrate our triumphs, and foster a community dedicated to the excellence in the school setting. your speech therapy PD podcast host for School of Speech. I'm so excited to be here today. School of Speech is designed for school-based SLPs to come together to explore current trends, share insights, and really champion our expertise. Our goal is to bolster confidence, celebrate our triumphs, and foster a community that is really dedicated to our excellence in the school setting. Today's episode is titled Autism, What the Words Mean and Why That Matters. And Angie Neal is with us today. She's going to be navigating us through the differences among terminology that is frequently associated with pragmatics. She'll be discussing key regulations of IDEA relative to the assessment of students who exhibit characteristics consistent um, with autism. She'll also be outlining critical data that is needed for SLPs um, in order to really assess pragmatics and determine educational and functional impact. So as we start settling in for another phenomenal episode, I do have a little bit of housekeeping. So School of Speech is runs for 60 minutes and will be offered for 0.1 ASHA CEUs. Angie, financial disclosures for Angie, she is receiving an honorarium for her participation in today's episode. Non-financial, she is a member of ASHA's uh, School Issue Advisory Board, also the State Education Agency Communication Disabilities Council Board, excuse me, and also she receives a salary from South Carolina State Department of Education. Uh, For me, I am salaried uh, from Portland Public Schools. I also am compensated for my graduate courses I teach at the University of Houston. Um, And I'm also a consultant across the nation supporting program development and staff training on all things feeding and swallowing. Um, And I also receive compensation from speechtherapypd.com for hosting School of Speech. Non-financial, I volunteer for Feeding Matters, and I'm a ASHA a, a member um, of Special Interest Groups 13, which is Swallowing and Swallowing Disorders, 14, Cultural and Linguistic Diversity, and, thir- uh, and 16, School-Based. Okay, that's enough about me. I know we all want to know more about Angie. Well, she is the SLP consultant for the South Carolina State Department of Education. She is a member of ASHA's School Issue Advisory Board and also a board member with the State Education Associate Communication Disabilities Council. And she is a graduate of the ASHA Leadership Development Program for school-based SLPs. Welcome, Angie. Yay, thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here and super excited about this topic. I just, again, can't thank you enough for letting me come share what I know, what I've learned. But I am so curious because I want to know your journey because we were talking before we got started And it was so funny to use the term research nerd. And I want to know more about that. That sounds amazing. So tell me your journey on becoming a research nerd. I'll be happy to (laughs) because I'm such a research nerd. So when I was in graduate school, which was a little while ago, I can vividly remember going, oh, we have to read another article and do all the things. Well, now that I've gotten into the school-based setting or once I got in the school-based setting, I have this thirst to meet, not just want, 
need to learn and know more. And what I have found is the more that I read, the more that I research, the more confident I am in my therapy and the more confident I am in my meetings and the more confidence you display in that meeting and come across as like the smartest person in the room, the more people tend to listen to you. But of course, also the better your assessment and better the therapy. So I love to get on Google Scholar and just type in whatever I'm looking for. Uh, a lot of times it'll pull up an ASHA journal and a lot of times it doesn't. The other thing is I'm a huge reader of not fiction. Like I have all my friends who will go to the beach and they'll be sitting on the beach with their beach reads and things like that. And I have some kind of book open about language and literacy or autism or a whole host of things. And I, I don't just read it and flip the pages. I highlight, I dog ear, I write notes in the margin. Like I absolutely thirst and live to learn more about what we do. And a huge part of that is just because I love this field. I just absolutely love this field. You are my spirit animal. I love <laughs> everything you are saying. I am the same way. I can't get enough, right? Yes, I just yeah. can't get enough. And I know everyone listening today, we are going to get into social communication and let's jump right in because I, I think let's start really, we're talking about words, you know, the words and what they say and, and words matter. So do you want to just start by sharing differences between social skills and social communication? Absolutely. So, and I'll even back up a little bit with yeah. kind of how I started wrapping my head around this. So for an extended period of time, I have felt like we are not doing kids a great service in how we're assessing them. Okay. And so it took, a, it took me a while to sort of wrap my head around, okay, what is it about our assessments that's not really capturing what these behaviors are and what they actually need? And what it all boiled down to for me is when I looked at the IDEA definition of autism and right. also the DSM-5 definition. And so if you think about the uh, IDEA definition of autism, there's eight big key terms, which Ooh. is verbal, nonverbal, social interaction, adverse educational impact, repetitive activity, stereotype behaviors, resistance to change, and of course, the hypo hypersensitivity. So the key thing, though, with those eight different terms, just those eight terms, is how well does everyone else on the team know what those terms are and what those developmental expectations are? And oh. so I think that's always a great question to share with your sky so school psychologist because you and the school psychologists are really the ones who are doing the evaluation. And at least in our state, the speech language pathologist is tasked with assessing pragmatics. Yep. But even from a speech end, what do we mean when we say pragmatics? Because social skills is not just social skills. And if you think about it, when we think about social skills, we typically think, oh, you know, manners and saying yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, which that would be culturally appropriate in my state. As you can tell, I have a Southern accent, but in some other places, maybe not. So having that understanding of what we really mean, even as speech language pathologists, when we say pragmatics. Now, where this becomes super important and y'all are probably in the same boat as all of my speech language pathologists in my state in schools. We are getting more and more and more referrals for pragmatics or for yeah. social skills. But what we're finding is it'll be referrals because a child is hiding under the table at lunchtime or something like that. That is not a social skill. So a huge part of the training that I've been getting out is what do we really mean when we say social skill? So that starts with us understanding that social skills aren't just one thing. Social skills includes a whole bunch of things. It includes joint attention. It includes inferencing and prediction. And boy, oh boy, do I go into a big old soapbox about play. Also adjusting language based on the context also executive function and emotional regulation. That's a huge piece. Narrative skills. That's another big one. Nonverbal skills. And what, how are we assessing that is better than a, set, a question about what are we assessing? So all of those things factor in for us to know as it relates to what we mean by pragmatics. So one of the things that I do when I talk about pragmatics in any 
any training that I'm doing is I first start with helping people appreciate that that term pragmatics, as we know as speech language pathologists, pragmatics is an umbrella term. And especially when I present with school psychologists, I compare that to phonological awareness. So phonological awareness is also an umbrella term. And under that umbrella term for phonological awareness, we have phoneme segmentation, phoneme blending, syllable segmentation, syllable blending. Like there's all these skills underneath it. Because the big takeaway I want for my school psychologist is that pragmatics is not simply social skills. Then I get into helping them understand that there's a huge difference between social skills and social communication. So allow me to sort of go mm -hmm. through this a little bit, because again, for me, I think this is very key for appropriate assessment. So if you think about it this way, so let's think about social skills. So a social skill would be something like saying please when you request something or not insisting on being the one with, who gets the blue piece every single time, those kind of social skills. And what that means is in your therapy room or in the classroom, if you teach that one skill and in that one setting, in that one context, you can teach it and they'll probably demonstrate it. Like you and I have probably seen this a million times. Okay, our social skill that we're gonna address today is gonna be taking turns. You teach it, these are smart kids, they're gonna get it right away. Now, here's the difference though, and this is what makes all the difference in the world. Social communication, as compared to social skills, social communication is understanding why that skill is important and how to apply it across broader contexts. So let me give you a great analogy. So the analogy that I like to use, and I think this probably applies for anywhere in the United States, is think about the skill of ordering food. So if you go to Subway or Chipotle, those types of restaurants, when you order a food, okay, you're ordering the food. So that's a skill. Well, at Subway, you say you want this kind of sandwich, this kind of bread, choice of cheese, toasted or not, like piece by piece by piece by piece until you get to the end. And then the uh, cash register person is like, okay, are you going to have the cookie? And yes, definitely always get the cookie. <laughs> All right. So that's a skill of ordering food in that context. Social communication is understanding that at Applebee's or Ruth's Chris or another sit down restaurant is that you have that same skill that you have to demonstrate of ordering food, but it's different in a different context. Because you can't order your meal at Applebee's like you do at Subway. So sure. again, it's the same skill, but social communication is understanding why that skill is important and how to apply it across different contexts. And that social communication piece to me is where we don't quite go deep enough. And also why we have we can't do social alone. We have to make sure that we're including our other educators and team members because social doesn't happen just in that two times 30 minutes a week. So we've got, to, I'm a huge proponent of collaborative goals that if we're targeting social and social interaction, everybody needs to be assigned to that goal. And for quick clarification, IDEA does not require discipline specific goals. I'll say that again. Mm -hmm. IDEA does not require discipline specific goals. You can have one goal and multiple people addressing it. And my favorite thing about this, and I know I'm totally just going on and on and on. Oh, uh, keep it up. Thing, <laughs> well, my <laughs> favorite thing about the collaborative goals is their shared ownership because mm -hmm. we're all assigned to it. And so we don't get to the annual review and go, okay, SLP, how are the social skills? first of all, we have to clarify what we really mean by social skill versus social communication, but then it's on everyone. And so everyone should be able to talk about what that student's social communication looks like in the different contexts. I am actually very well said. And I, my aha that you just gave me is really, yes, we hear social skills, social skills. We even have social skill curriculum and programs for social skills. So that, so if you think about as a speech pathologist being specialized instruction, ours is the social communication. You hit it like on the head, smack on when you said understanding the why and how to apply it. 
Because right, I mean, we could you imagine having a goal for every little social skill? Say thank you, say yes, ma'am, you know, versus and in every different context. Well, you couldn't possibly, but understanding, right. oh, I that just that that blew my mind today. So right now, that's my biggest takeaway as we speak. We need to start using social communication as what we are teaching. What yes. we are not teaching. Yeah, yeah, I say teaching, but yeah, but that's yeah. what we are working on that portion of the social skill. That's how we are contributing to that collaborative goal. And the other big piece for me is as SLPs in the school-based setting, and I have to say everything I do as a speech language pathologist in the school has an ulterior motive of language and literacy, <laughs> everything, like okay. everything I do. So a huge thing for me is how are we documenting that adverse educational impact? Because I will be the first person to tell you that most of our students on the autism spectrum are brilliant students. And so like, take for example, people like Greta Thunberg, okay? She is an expert in climate change. And not only will she change the world because of her very specialized expertise, but she is changing the world because of her very specialized expertise. But for us as school-based speech language pathologists, if we can't support that adverse educational impact piece, not only will they not be successful academically, but they won't be able to communicate this information once they get into the real world and in a real job where you have to collaborate because you can't know all the things about everything. You have to work with a team to make all of these discoveries. Okay, exactly. And I mean, when I think... One of the things I think kind of this common thread that I always seem to try to pull through each of the episodes I've ever done is really the importance of school-based therapy. Mm -hmm. And basically you just hit it again. I mean, you just, you're knocking it out of the park here tonight. I'm loving it. Is that what is the adverse effect? That's what we're remediating. Like that's what we want to fix or in order for them to be, um successful yeah absolutely and if you think about again going back to idea if there's not an adverse educational impact they're not eligible as a student with a disability under idea you have to have some kind of documentation that supports or data that supports that there is an adverse educational impact. So if you want, I'll now go down that rabbit hole of like the, my favorite things to consider in terms of adverse educational impact. Okay, hold on. Um, okay. So Stephanie just said, what did you, when you were saying you always work in the, and then I want to go back to exactly that. Okay. We're going down that rabbit hole, but hold on. Okay. You said you work in the context of literacy. Tell, expand on that again. Cause that was, yes. that was a nugget that I think I missed as well. Okay. So ag again, everything I do is with the ulterior motive of language and literacy lens, because for me, that is our jam. Like whether you speak it, read it or write it, it's all language. So the more we can collaborate about those language aspects, the more we're better able to help students be successful at their job, which is to learn to read and comprehend really well what they read. So everything I do is under that lens of language and literacy. So as I start talking about the adverse educational impact, you're gonna hear exactly what I mean by that in looking at adverse educational impact. So you ready to go there? I, okay, wait, wait, I'm buckling up. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, so when I'm doing an assessment and I'm looking at adverse educational impact, here's some of the things that I'm looking for specifically. Number one, well, the, okay, I take that back. These are not in any particular order. Okay. But one of the first things I would say would be figurative language. So we know that most of our buddies on the autism spectrum are very concrete, literal thinkers. Well, if you struggle with figurative language, not only are you going to struggle with reading fiction and comprehending fiction in particular, but you're also going to have difficulty with oral language. And again, going back to our culture and here in the Southeast, we use a lot of idioms, a lot of idioms. And so if you don't know and can't comprehend figurative language, you're going to struggle to understand what the teacher is talking about. Now, I'll circle back to this in a minute, but difficulty with theory of mind relates specifically to, excuse me, different difficulty with figurative language relates to theory of mind. 
being able to have that cognitive flexibility to think about something in a different way. Um, so that's one. Another big one, and this is this is one sometimes people find a, a little controversial, but I feel like the ability to label emotions is a semantic task. Now, are we the only people who should be teaching that emotional regulation part? No, but we need to be part of the team that's addressing not only how do we identify the, the emotion we're feeling based on how our body is feeling, but also how to recognize it, that nonverbal piece in other people and then mm. giving it an appropriate label. And I'll be the first one to say, I'm going to get on my soapbox here and say, if you are using materials to teach emotion that are based on emojis and things like that, we're not going to ever get anywhere. And the reason for that is if you ever look at a picture of someone, if you look at a picture of someone who is really, really sad and crying and someone who is really, really happy, they look the same. If you look at their facial expression, they look the same. What tells you the difference is the context. So the bigger picture behind them. So in my presentations, I like to use exactly a picture like that. So it looks like somebody is very, very sad. This woman's got a really big, sad face. She's crying. But then I open up the picture and it's not that she's sad. You see, she's wearing Olympic medals. So the context told us what that emotion is. Now, by the same token, I show a similar picture and the person's face has a big circle on it so you can't see it but it's somebody leaning over a casket. So context tells us the expected emotion and you don't even have to see the person's face. So again, I'd, I'd take that to a semantic piece. Nonverbal, oh boy, howdy, do we really have to do a better job with assessment of nonverbal? And we're getting to nonverbal uh, a little bit more when we talk about assessment. Going back to the language and literacy piece, we don't ever think about how much play connects directly with comprehension and play and narrative skills and making inferences and predictions, being able to monitor ourselves and self-monitor while we read. So that metacognitive skill and of course, point of view and perspective taking. You can't get, you can't learn point of view by playing a video game. You have to interact with other humans in order to get an understand point of view. So one of my favorite things that I've done is our state just redid our English language arts standards. And I went into our English language arts standards and pulled out exactly what are the standards that have a connection, a direct connection to pragmatics and the skills under that umbrella of pragmatics. And the number one thing is the ability to ask and answer questions. But now think about the ability to ask and answer questions. What does that require? Well, the ability to ask and, quest, ask and answer questions requires that you have knowledge of that mm -hmm. rules of conversation. So I love this story. So let me give you this little example about rules of conversation. So every year in February, my favorite thing to do was always to go around and tell jokes, corny dad jokes. And the reason I do that is because that's an awesome way to practice your speech sound production at the sentence level. It's also a great way to practice uh, your language skills because that's all multiple meaning words and phonological awareness. And if you're not sure what I mean, let me give you an example. Especially because we're this close to Halloween. What? What is a ghost? What do ghosts wear? What do ghosts wear? What do ghosts wear? Boo jeans. <laughs> so that's a phonological awareness deletion test. So anyway, so we'd always go around in February because February is nasty and nobody wants to be there and it's too long until spring break. So anyway, we go around and we tell jokes. Well, when we talk about the rules of conversation, that very much applies to going and telling jokes. You just can't walk up to somebody and say, hey, you want to hear a joke? What do you call a smelly fairy? Stinker bell. That doesn't work that way. You also have to be able to presuppose what that other person is thinking. So like if you're just walking up and you're standing there, you have to presuppose what that other person is thinking, especially because our favorite people were always to target the sec school secretary. Mm -hmm. And so if we walk up to the school secretary and of course she's elbow deep in paperwork and the telephone, that's not a good time. And so we have to know that based on the nonverbal 
and then walk away. And of course, that perspective taking. So all of those things go into just answering and asking questions. Um, but some other things that will likely be in your state standards too, again, that will help you document uh, adverse educational impact is narrative ability. Narrative ability is how we create shared understanding. So even when you finish this webinar today or you finish listening to it, you're not going to go back and you're not going to spout a bunch of facts that I told you today. You're going to go share this story. And that, that will be your shared understanding. And now you're sharing it with somebody else. So scary uh, uh, narrative skills are uniquely human. And that is how we connect to each other, especially social. So in school, kids have to write narratives all of the time. So that's a big one. Summarizing and paraphrasing. That's another big standard that you're likely to see. You're likely going to also have standards related to figurative language and inference and even collaboration, cognitive flexibility. All of those things are likely going to be some of the ELA standards that you can collect that data on. And before I just totally go too far down this hole, when I talk about uh, narrative skills, I have to sing the praises all day long and I'm not a paid person for it, but the NLM cubed is the bomb. Say that it again. The, the N as in Nancy, L as in language, M as in measure. So it's the narrative language measure cubed. It is free. It's online. It's connected with an intervention program for narrative. And that intervention program connects with vocabulary. It's not something unique or specific just to speech language pathologists. So this is something you can train your teachers to do. It's one of the greatest things since sliced bread. Okay. Okay, I just popped that in and yeah, there it is. I'm going to pop that in the in the chat so everybody that is listening is going to get that in the chat. All right, I'm doing that now. So anyway, those are some of the big adverse educational impact pieces um, that I see. And again, now think about, go back to your assessment. Are these things that you're typically including in your assessment? And if you aren't, could they be? And I, I, again, I'm really going to hit on play, especially. And let me give you a story about play. So I had a little girl who moved in. It was like, a, I guess it was October. She moved in from New York. She, parents lost custody. So now she was living with the grandmother. Well, she was on the autism spectrum and she was very echolalic. Second grader, very echolalic. And she, what she would repeat was everything that she was watching on YouTube. So her favorite thing for a period of time was, that's all folks. Mm -hmm. That's all folks. All right. What's that from? Looney Tunes. So she was yeah. watching that over and over. Well, I didn't want to start with things like asking and answering questions. What I needed to start with was play because play is where we create that meaningful connection with other people. And I'm here to tell you, Carol Westby is the end all be all on play. And she has a whole free online thing that talks about the different stages of play, as well as pre-symbolic versus symbolic play and what the developmental milestones are for that. So that is an incredible resource for looking at play. But again, I'm here to tell you, you're going to struggle to make progress in your social communication therapy if they don't have that understanding and foundation in play. And I don't let anybody tell you all you're doing is playing. Nope. We're learning language. We're making language meaningful. This is a language rich experience. I'm putting in Carol Westby. I it's West West, like W E S T B B Y. So put yes. that in the chat. Okay, West play. Yeah. Yeah, the power of play. You know, we play with pur purpose. I know I always hate when you hear people say they they go to speech, they just play games all day. No. Well, so and here's what I do with that, because I would always have my students ask me. What are we playing today? Mm -hmm. And so I would counter that with usually, actually, usually I would say Andy Lankay. So I'd turn it into like pig Latin. And then they have to do that phonological awareness task of ah. figuring out what I was actually saying. But I also am very quick to say, it's not play, you're learning. And let me tell you how I reinforce that. So what I do or did when I was still in the, directly in the schools before I was now up at the state level, um, I would always give a criterion reference test at the end of every nine weeks to every student. 
And then they would chart their progress towards their goal on just a really simple like set of squares and they would just color in for however many they had. But the reason I did that is because I wanted them to be co-partners in this. Because if we're not, if they're not aware of what they're working on or why they're working on it or where the goal is to go, you are responsible for all the things. I don't want to be responsible for all the things. I often would tell them and tell parents the this connection that would you ever, if you had an ear infection, would you ever only take the antibiotic at the doctor's office? No. Okay. You have to have some ownership in this. And so that is a great way to do that. It's also a great way to capture some data and look at progress over time. I am loving your analogies. I'm so sorry. No, I'm not so sorry. I'm so happy. I, I love when you just said to explain it, not just to a student, but to the families that exactly, would you only take that antibiotic for the urea infection just in the doctor's office? Mm -hmm. I love, that is a nugget right there. And that works for all kinds of therapy, not just mm -hmm. social communication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. That just, I love, I love the way that you are explaining things because it's just, it's so easy for me to listen to. And I'm, I'm sitting here going, yeah, that is exactly right. I am loving it. So, okay. I feel like assessment is really kind of where we're, what we're really talking about tonight. Let's get into that. Cause okay. what are the, what are the, I, I was trying to write those all down real, right quick, but I might've missed a few. So let's back up a little bit and let's really get into like the importance of assessment. Okay. I love that. I think that's a perfect place to go next. So let me start by saying, are you ready? The absolute worst way to assess social communication and pragmatics is with a standardized tool. Okay. I'll say it again. The worst way to assess pragmatics and social communication is with a standardized tool. And here's why. Because in the real world, we don't interact with pictures and what ifs. Mm. So think about it this way. A lot of times those tools will say things like, okay, uh, what's a good birthday gift for a friend? Well, you tell me. What is a good birthday gift for a friend? Same thing with, are you allowed to touch somebody's hair? Well, you tell me. Because basically those, the answer to those two things are, it depends. Mm -hmm. And what does it depend on? It depends on the context that you're in. So for a birthday gift, it depends on if you're four years old or 50 years old. It depends on if this is somebody you're close with or maybe not close with. It depends on if it's your father-in-law who buys all the things for himself anyway. And so you always are struggling to find what to get him. So you end up getting him a Lowe's gift card. So if anybody else is in that same boat, just give me an amen on that. Because whew. Now, the other thing to appreciate about standardized assessments is, again, number one, they don't take into account context. They don't take into account what this child actually looks like communicating socially in the real world. And here's the key thing to think about social interactions in the real world. Think about the impact of timing. Think about the impact of your emotional regulation. So let's say you're wearing that itchy sweater that mom made you wear. And so you're a little bit keyed up anyway. So that's going to impact your emotional regulation. Think about kind of your situational awareness of what's going on at the moment. And then also the impact of the nonverbal cues. So standardized assessments do not take in any of that into consideration. The other thing is when you're talking about standardized assessment, and I get on a big old soapbox about our language assessments, most of them are not valid and reliable. And by valid and reliable, I mean, they do not have diagnostic accuracy because they are not, they don't have, they don't meet that threshold of 80% sensitivity and specificity. I can think of maybe on one hand, how many language and or pragmatic language assessment tools have appropriate diagnostic accuracy. Now you tell me, how often are we using these standardized assessment tools, including the ADOS? Mm -hmm. to say you have a presence of a disability, but that tool doesn't meet that threshold of 80% sensitivity and specificity. Because even at 80%, you still have 20% of kids who are going to be misdiagnosed or misclassified. 
So, and when you think about that misclassification, A, that can make your caseload be higher than it should be, but it can also mean that some of the students who really need us aren't able to see us because we're not using a tool that's diagnostically accurate. So that's a little spiel right there on standardized assessment. Now, the other thing that I wanted to get into when we talk about assessment, so we've talked a lot about adverse educational impact, but now I want to talk about assessment from the standpoint of neurodiversity. So neurodiversity, first of all, what does it mean? And then how does this impact our assessments? So neurodiversity is really just that appreciation that everybody's different. Everybody's mind is different. And there's no one behavioral ideal that we should all ascribe to, that we should all hope to get to. So for example, we should really and truly embrace the fact that we don't all think the same and that that because we don't all think the same, not only is that inevitable, that's valuable. Because like I said, I'm going to come up with the cure for cancer because that is not my skill set. But right. somebody who's super detail oriented, they're going to see details that nobody else would see. And again, so that's something we want to embrace. So neurodiversity is really that idea that we're not, our whole purpose is not to quote unquote cure autism. We're not going to, and we don't shouldn't want to. Right. We want to make sure that we're providing them with the skills that they need to be successful. And that's that social communication, as well as addressing that adverse educational impact. So when you think about assessment under a neurodiverse view, first of all, we have to make sure we're evaluating and getting the data on that adverse educational impact. The other one is a big one, is we have to make sure that not only us, but the school psychologist, that we're not looking at these actions or behaviors and without looking at the reason or the cause of the behavior. So let me hang out here for just a second on this behavior thing. So what tends to happen is we often get, we get referrals or we'll get a student and they'll say, well, ready? Well, all behavior is communication. So that's you, SLP. You get to address all that. Well, here's the here's how I explain this when we talk about all behaviors communication. All right. How many of you have ever seen all the TikTok videos and whatnot of people having meltdowns at the airport? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you've seen lots of videos of people having meltdowns at the airport. So now let's think about, OK, well, let's think about that situation. First of all, do we think that they have the language to appropriately communicate what their concerns are? Yeah. Do they likely have the underlying skills of planning, uh, emotional regulation? So even just think about having to go through the TSA pre-check lane. You have to demonstrate waiting. You have to demonstrate uh, patience. I demonstrate fear because it just always makes me nervous. So they have these underlying skills, but the difference is they chose not to use them. Okay. So a huge part of the assessment is to figure out, and this is where our role comes in, was this occurring because they didn't have the underlying linguistic knowledge, language knowledge, social communication language knowledge, or they have that knowledge and just didn't apply it. They chose not to apply it. Now, why this is really important is because when we talk about specially designed instruction, what's the point of teaching them skills they already know? Right. Heavy, heavy, so, right on. Yes. And, and think about LRE and faith. So we have to make sure we're teasing out the reason for the behaviors. And so, again, when we think about, quote, unquote, all behavior, so it, all behaviors communication, that's not taking into account the cause of the behavior. And if we never ad address that underlying cause, we're not going to ever remediate what the needs are. So we, here, let me give you another good story. So mm -hmm. I actually was doing this presentation just last week and I had somebody come up to me. We were just talking at, at lunch afterwards and she said her niece was three years old, wasn't talking, wasn't walking. And uh, long story short, the parents found that the child had a really bad ear infection. So they 
put it off getting the ear tubes and things like that. And again, the child still wasn't walking or talking. Lo and behold, they finally go and get the PE the P -E tubes put in. Child starts walking the next day. She just had so much fluid in her ear. She couldn't maintain balance to stand up. Oh my gosh. So this really, that's a very clear demonstration of the need to address the underlying cause. And once you address that cause, then you're going to see that improvement in the, in the behaviors. Again, mic drop. So everybody it's, in the back. It's, it's true. I want everyone to hear that, that what, and I'm, Correct me if I'm wrong, Angie, but what I think, what I'm hearing, and this is th the clarity of what you've said is just mind blowing, wonderfully wonderful is that our job is to address, I'll be fancy, the etiology. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yes. But the, I like that. The cause of the behavior. And that's what we, that's what we're charged to do. Yes, Not is to really say, do they have that linguistic language, pragmatic social communication knowledge? And, or if they do, why aren't they using it? Mm -hmm. And so again, that's where your observations across different contexts comes into play. So let me give you another story. So I had a referral that I was part of a comprehensive evaluation and the referral for was for suspicion of autism. Well, this child was in third grade and this child had been referred because he kept getting suspended. He was, kept doing these behaviors and he would end up getting suspended and half a day, you know, here and there. And it got to be a lot. Bright child. So anyway, I go pick up this child and we're walking down the hall. We're having the most fabulous, wonderful conversation about what he did over the summer. We get into my, my speech therapy room. And of course I have lots of fun things. So my room has always been pirate themed because I love working on R. Yeah. Mm -hmm. are so we get in my room and he see these pirate ships so we start playing pirates so i'm getting all this great data about his play skills his theory of mind skills his language skills just from you know just from that play context well what we found out is the reason this child was acting out and having these behaviors the cause was because the child wanted to go home and play his video games he didn't want to be at school and oh. so once we addressed and understood what that underlying cause was, because I'd already established he has those underlying language skills, mm -hmm. then we addressed that underlying cause and then we saw that improvement. So exactly. I'll, I'll, and I'll lead it, I'll lead all of that discussion about uh, be, all behaviors communication piece mm -hmm. to really start talking to about the increase in the incidence and prevalence of autism. Because uh, I was just doing this presentation for our state's Association of School Psychologists, and I had somebody come up and ask me, do I feel like we're seeing an increase in the incidence and prevalence because of screen time? And I told them, really and truly, it's multi-factor. But let me give you a little bit of data about the increase in screen time, I mean, the increase in autism. So what we know is when CDC, Center for Disease Controls, first started reporting incidence and prevalence of autism, that was ba back in 2007. It was one in 150. In 2021, so scooting up pretty far, but 2021 is one in 44. Um, Two years later, 2023, it was one in 36. That is a 320% increase. Oh. And that's just the CDC. Now, I, a research nerd, I went and did some digging into IDEA classifications. Mm -hmm. I did it both US-wide and our state. So US-wide, we're seeing an increase of about 19.5% over the past two years. So 2020-21 school year, 2022-23 school year. So in two years, we've seen about a 19.5% increase in autism. But the majority of the increase is in preschool. Now, I know all of you who are in working with preschoolers right now, you're saying amen because you mm -hmm. see it too. So the increase in preschool U.S.-wide over those two years was 33%. Two years. So I did some digging in my state. And what I found in our state of South Carolina, 
our increase over two years was about 23%. But let me tell you our preschool number. Our preschool number was 61%. What? 61% in autism classifications in preschool over two years. Okay, re uh, research nerd, why? Again, I think it's a multifactored. <laughs> I think what happens is kids come in and they demonstrate these behaviors. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. think we're looking to really assess whether or not they they have the underlying language skills. I think a lot of them are not uh, being having the opportunity to learn these language skills for two reasons. One, we're putting an obstacle in the way of developing social skills. That would be your iPad, your phones, your iPhones, things like that. Also, the adults being on their phones. And this is a whole other whole other yeah, rabbit hole yeah, for yeah, screen time. Yeah. But, but also, again, I think if we don't know what we're really looking for, mm -hmm. a lot of things look like autism. But it's really just that social communication piece. The social communication crosses over a lot of different disabilities. So one of the big things that I also talk about is how do we differentiate? So what are some of the questions we need to be asking to really differentiate? Is this autism or is it something else? Mm -hmm. But I see a question just popped up about, do I think it's being overdiagnosed? Again, I, I think we have an overclassification. Okay. I think there's many factors that go into that. I think number one being number one and two, uh, not any particular order, I would say that opportunity to okay. be social is a big one. I also think it's, again, I don't think we're really getting it right in our evaluations. Okay. Well, you know, we had another question about evaluations when you were talking about, and I want to know the answer too, Deb, so I did say I'd come back to it, is what language and pragmatic assess assessments um, are meeting that 80% accuracy? So I will tell there is maybe one. So I will say, and I'm not, again, here to represent tests or anything like that. I will say that from a, and you want just the pragmatic one specifically, right? Okay. I will say this, the social language development test for elementary, elementary age kids, it's 82% and 86% sensitivity and specificity. But the social language development test for adolescents is 71% and 96%. Okay. So that one is not. Test of problem solving, that one is 64% and 92%. So that doesn't meet that threshold. The test of pragmatic language, the manual doesn't even include sensitivity and specificity. So again, okay. how would you defend that? Okay. Wow. So, and, and for me, a huge thing for me in the guidance that I provide is it's not about the test. It's not about the score. And I know school psychologists, especially, and these are my people, like school psychologists are my people. Um, they're so accustomed to asking, what was the score? Did he qualify? Mm -hmm. But it's right. not about the score. And IDEA is very clear that it says you cannot determine eligibility based on one sole criterion. So a lot of times what people will say is, okay, well, my state requires a standardized assessment tool. Well, professionally, it is then on us to say, here's the limitations of this tool. I can use this tool qualitatively to gather some data, but we can't make this determination based on a score because it is not, and again, this is another IDEA reg, it's not technically sound, meaning it's not valid and reliable. So again, put all that information in your uh, qualitative information in your evaluation report, but don't use that score. Don't report that score if you don't have diagnostic accuracy. Um, another question, uh, maybe just a little bit more clarity. Um, when when you're talking like the missing piece is really that underlying uh, language skill. And then because we aren't looking at that the way we need to be looking at it, um, Jessica was asking, um, are you talking specifically about that school psychs need to do that or speech needs to do that? 
speech. Okay, that is that is yeah. what we're charged with. Okay, that's yes. our job. So again, going back to those uh, things that I mentioned, so in young children, especially looking at those nonverbal skills, and let me pause here, and I know we're getting late on time, but let me pause just a second here on nonverbal skills. So if you if you think about how we assess nonverbal skills, how do we do that? Well, typically we ask the parent, does your child use nonverbal skills? Does your child use gestures? Does your child have facial expressions? Well, think about a lay person who's not an SLP, who doesn't know all this lingo. When you say gestures, what do you think most people are thinking when you say gestures? What's the first thing that pops in their mind? I would even go so far as to say this. Way. Oh, I was going to do that too. Okay. For those that are just going to be listening, I waved because I'm a lady and yes. uh, Angie though used a certain middle finger. <laughs> yes. Yes. Because they think of that as a gesture. And so instead of asking, <laughs> does your child use them? Yes or no. We need to give them a list of gestures to say, sure. does your child use these? And then what we know is there's not necessarily a threshold to say, okay, well, if you only used 12 out of these 18 gestures, does that mean they struggle with nonverbal gestures? No, because if you think about nonverbal, nonverbal is still more than just gestures. Just uh, nonverbal is also eye gaze. Nonverbal is also looking at body language and understanding body language. It's your tone of voice. It's prosody. It's your posture. It's all of these different things. And that to me is where our knowledge and observing that child in a real world situation, using our knowledge as SLPs about nonverbal that's where our expertise really comes in. Mm -hmm. Right. That's our, that's our, our piece. So and I'm here to tell you, like just that research nerd piece, mm -hmm. research nerd over here will tell you that gestures and eye gaze, those two things in particular are key differentiators between whether or not a, a child is more language based or it's a true autism spectrum. And so what the, what and the research again, will I'm sorry, say yeah. that one more time, I missed it. Yes, the research will tell you gestures and eye gaze okay. are two key differentiating characteristics or two differentiating distinguishing features in that if you struggle with nonverbal and eye gaze, that's a distinguishing feature indicative of developmental days, delays such as autism. Okay. Because if you think about it, your regular SLI kids, your re regular language kids, they don't struggle with those, do they? No. No. But your students on the autism spectrum do. Not only using them, but understanding them. Exactly. I'm telling you, that assessment piece for nonverbal is a big key, a big mm -hmm. key to appropriate di di uh, diagnosis. And also how we, how we're, getting that data on nonverbal because I think the point you're saying exactly if you just asked uh, the question do they use gestures we're not really we don't know really what the answer really is telling us mm -hmm. and again I'll circle back to Carol Westby Carol Westby has a whole thing on gestures including what gestures should be developed by what age? And if you know that developmental expectation, then you can come up with a percent delay. Like if you've got to have some kind of number, you can come up with percent delay, say they're, and I'm awful at math, but let's say they're 20, 24 months old and their gestures are at a 12 month old, that's a 50% delay. Mm -hmm. Then you have a quantitative number, which a lot of people are like, no, I gotta have a number. Yeah, we want that. We do want that. We want easy math though too. <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, I think the field of speech language pathology is shifting to really appreciate it's not about the test. It's about your informed clinical opinion. It's, about all, it's about all of the data, triangulating all the data, the totality of all the data. And yeah, that's what makes us experts in what we do and why we come and we listen to things like this mm -hmm. and why. We like to research all these different articles on eye gaze and gestures. Right. And just going back and thanks, Deb, for also kind of saying that, you know, in certain districts, they only have certain assessments available for them, to them. Mm -hmm. And we don't have access to everything. But I guess what 
what hopefully I'm hearing this right is, yeah, we're going to go ahead and do a standard assessment because yes, we are told, voluntold, we must do that. Um, but then we are going to not rely on that specifically or uh, um, alone. Right. Um, we're going to use that to give us information. Qualitative information. Qualita that's the word I was like trying to like talk around. Qualitative yeah. data that then we are going to do way more of that informal and dynamic assessment, especially. Okay. In, in other words, we want to teach this skill. We, we see that this skill is on this assessment tool that we already know is not diagnostically accurate, but we want to then teach it to them and then see how quickly they pick it up or how much scaffolding they need. And what we know about typical development, typical development, you teach it, they pick it right up. Mm -hmm. Atypical development, that's not quite as easy to pick up or it requires a lot of scaffolding. Dynamic assessment is a beautiful thing. And I think we really overthink it. Like we, we want it to be this really challenging, difficult thing. It's not. It's test, teach, retest. How much support did they need? How quickly did they use it and adapt it? Mm -hmm. Don't overthink it, okay. which is really hard for us. Because that seems to be what we do. We want to, yes. we, you know, and we, we want to, I think because we so, we all want to make sure we don't miss anything and that we, but I like it. Keep it simple. I love that kiss, you know, keep it yeah. stupid or something. Yeah. 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 Keep it super you know? simple. Keep it super simple. Oh, that's a more, that's more like, yeah. I like it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Keep it simple. Test. No, teach. Uh, yeah. Test. I did a test. Figure out what the weaknesses are. Teach it. Teach again, it. teach it and then retest it. See how much support they needed. And if you think about it, what's the beautiful thing about dynamic assessment is it will tell you if it's truly a lack of opportunity, a lack of ex social exposure, as opposed to a lack of that underlying language knowledge. And that that right there makes the distinction on whether or not they come on your caseload. Yes, ma'am. I mean, ding, 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 winner, winner, mm -hmm. chicken dinner. So mm -hmm. we, our job is, yes, if we did one test, yeah, does, there is a deficit in the skill. But mm -hmm. we need, because that's what it, you know, but then we have to find out do they actually chose not to do it or mm -hmm. do they have the, do they not have the language needed for that? Mm -hmm. And I'm coming back to, I kind of want to know too, those, you said those nonverbal norms, and I think we all want to get our hands on that. Is that on Carol Westby's, is that on her um, site or how can we I get cannot remember exactly where I found it, but I will tell you this. I have a bunch of all of this stuff that I've talked about. I've got on my teachers pay teachers page. Um, and I'll think I included that in the disclosures or whatever, but How I have a bunch of- How do we find you on Teachers Pay Teachers? I think I'm just Angie Neal, Greenville, South Carolina, Word Nerd, SLP. I think that's what I am on there. But I have a lot of these kind of things. And then also some things really to sort of help think about it in terms of the therapy end too. So for example, I haven't been able to find a test that includes figurative language. If someone knows of one, please let me know. So I created something so that we can look at figurative language. So I put some, just something super simple there and then how to teach it, all of those kind of things. Like there's, ugh. but again, it's the, we don't have, I don't think we've quite nailed it with our assessment tools yet. So for me, I'm still piecemealing it together. So a thing for figurative language here, a thing to look at the play, a thing for looking specifically at the gestures, type of gestures and again all off the shoulders of giants like people like carol westby okay so i think what i'm hearing is that we 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 need more to do oh thanks stephanie um yes she says that the south metalinguistic has a figurative language set uh section thank you stephanie Ooh. yes thank you it takes a village we're a village we love this i love this yes. thanks for sharing absolutely so Okay, I know we're coming to the end of our evening and I'm so sad, but basically we're saying a test is not enough. And a, a, exactly. a, a, standard, a standardized assessment is just not enough. Um, no way. 
and and we're doing the students a disservice if that is what we are basing our eligibility criteria on. Especially if it's only looking at pragmatics, quote unquote, under how we traditionally have thought of pragmatics. And we're really not under looking at those skills underneath pragmatics that truly have that adverse educational impact. And so we're really not able to give them the support they need to be successful. Um, so that, that's a big one. Big takeaway I hope that people take is what are we really looking at when we think about adverse educational impact and really supporting them to, so that they can find the cure to cancer by yeah. developing all these adverse, uh, these educational skills that they need to have to do that. And I think you've also given us some really good words to say why we aren't might not be picking a student up um, because they're hiding under a table um, mm -hmm. or what have you, that, that they have all these behaviors. And since behaviors communication, we can say they do not have a communication disorder. They are right. refusing to not uh, behave in what we would typically expect. Um, mm -hmm. but not that they don't understand that they shouldn't. Exactly. I, I that right. I hope I said that right. Yeah. Yes. And again, using that comparison to the airport meltdowns, we know in order to get to that point, they had to have all of these different communication skills and executive function skills for planning and all these different kind of things, but they're choosing not to demonstrate them. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? That is what we need to focus on. We need to focus on what is the underlying reason for these behaviors. Again, is it lack of linguistic knowledge or is it they're choosing not to apply what they know? So for those in the back, so when we are looking at pragmatics and our assessment, we are looking for the linguistic deficits versus the, the behavior choosing not to for easy, just for easy math on that. And that's powerful because I think, because like if we just gave the test that said, oh, we gave this test and they fell in a, you know, less than 1%, you know, below. And then they're like, they, they need you. And then you can actually say, well, actually upon further investigation, they actually do know how, what the expectations are, but in, mm -hmm. you know, situations of dysregulation. Exactly. And use the airport analogy about mm -hmm. dysregulation and how mm -hmm. a typically, well, we, some of them, I do question their typicalness in the airport <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean not yeah. able to do you know they are choosing not to use those skills or they're so dysregulated they can't be they're not able to but that's not right. that they don't have it it's not a disability and that's not something we need to pull them from class to teach them we don't want to teach what there's no reason to teach them what they already know it's just gonna make them mad <laughs> why so, are you teaching me what I already know right so right and I guess that's another good good thing to say is speech therapy is not to teach them what they already know mm -hmm. right there. That's, that's powerful. You can't. Now, and, and also to kind of circle back to that collaborative piece too, of again, even if we don't need to teach them what they already know, we may still need to be team members. So okay. we may still need to be part of the, the team and we're, who's doing the problem solving, maybe as a supplementary service, things like that. But again, as a broader member of the team now, and I'll say this too, a lot of your special education teachers will say, no, that's your job. That's the SLP job. Well, actually, if you've looked at the praxis test for special education teachers, it includes knowledge of social skills, social development, all of those things. So no, we really need to work at the top of our license. And when we can train someone to do something, let them. Right. Because then it's not just us absorbing all of these kids all of the time, but we're training someone to provide those supports for a millennia. So every kid that they see, it won't always fall on us. We'll be there to support. We'll be there to share materials and do all kinds of things, but we need to not be martyrs and make our own caseloads worse than they are. We need to train people to also do these things who can and should. We also and we didn't even get into emotional regulation and executive function, but we really need to be including more social workers and guidance counselors and things like that as well. But that's a whole, that's a whole other story. Well, now that you've opened that can, let me ask you this, because um, we are getting to the end of, of our session or our episode today. Would you be willing to come back? Because I feel like we've got more to talk about. You've got more to share with us. I would love to see if we can't get you back on the books, get you back talking about more, because I think 
this is just such a hot topic and it it's so prevalent. Our our caseloads were drowning. And if we can really be better at our assessments, and I I I I need more. I need more Angie. I need more Angie. I'd be happy to anytime. You can tell this does not make me sad to talk about speech stuff all day long. I do it all. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, we're definitely going to have you back. And I hate that we have that we are at the end. It's been fantastic. And Deb sent um, a link, so everybody take a look at the the uh, chat link. Uh, it was the Theory of Mind by Carol West, uh, Westby. Yes. So I want everyone to take a look at that before um, we end. But as we end, we want to say thank you, Angie, so much for coming. I have like pages of notes. I just love every. I love the way that you explain things. I love the way that you use these analogies because parents and teachers are going to understand that and we mm -hmm. need to be able to explain things so they understand why no no one wants to hear no I don't want to hear no but right. when, you are, when you are framing it the way you're framing it there's no you, there's no it makes sense it just makes sense mm -hmm. and I thank you that you really you you laid on some great information for us tonight and I love it I just have to, before we end, and, and everyone, thank you, thank you, thank you. And we're getting you back on for sure. I, okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. And I look forward to seeing everybody next time. Bye, guys. Bye, Angie. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Thanks for joining us on today's podcast. Remember to go to speechtherapypd.com to learn more about earning ASHA CEUs. We appreciate your positive reviews and support and would love for you to write a quick review and subscribe. If you have indicated that you are part of the ASHA registry and entered both your ASHA number and a complete address in your account profile prior to the course completion, we will submit earn CEUs to ASHA. Please allow one to two months from the completion date for your CEUs to be reflected on your ASHA transcript. For our School of Speech listeners, we have a special coupon code to receive $20 off any annual subscription to speechtherapypd.com. Head over there to get ASHA CEUs for listening to this podcast and all other episodes. The code is SCHOOL20. That is S-C-H-O-O-L-20. Hope to see you on our next episode. Also, please don't hesitate to tell us which topics you would like us to cover in future episodes. To get in touch, drop us a line in the comment section or send us a message on social media.